I'm about to interview the highest requested interviewee based on community polls, and that's Jay Yap, my business partner. Jay has a super interesting story. He started out as a VA, and because of an incredible work ethic and a gift for search engine optimization, he worked his way up to being an actual partner in LeadSpring, and now he makes more money than he knows what to do with. Like I said, his story is incredible and we're about to get into it. But we're also about to get into a lot more than that. We'll discuss the nitty gritty details on how we do our SEO at our company LeadSpring. From the basic niche selection to advanced link building techniques. What it takes to scale a company from building niche sites to owning a fleet of huge authority sites. And the mindset it takes to go from a beginner to the top of your game in this industry. And I've sourced a lot of these questions from you guys, the community. Fasten your seatbelt, this interview is going to be intense. And remember to smash the like button if you appreciate all the nuggets that Jay is about to dish out. Out. Jay, thanks so much for coming on. Before we get started, why don't you give us a quick introduction to who you are and what you're doing in this world of SEO? So yeah, I'm Jay. Um, I've been doing SEO for about six years now. I'm currently the COO of LeadSpring, where I handle most of the operations and a little bit of R&D as well. Um, also, I do the affiliate lab where I, we teach SEO and affiliate marketing. And also, I do some consultations on the side whenever I have some free time. Nice, nice. Well, we'll get into that. We'll get into everything that you're doing these days, but let's take things back like 10 years ago. Where were you 10 years ago and what were you doing for a living? Oh, um, 10 years ago, I was still at college. So I was working part-time at Jollibee. So I was kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do in life. So my life was kind of messed at the time. So I was a little bit lost, but um, luckily my sister got me um, on the right path and tried to get me my, my life straight. So yeah, like she pushed me to do online work and that's when I started looking for online jobs. Nice, nice. Um, let's go back to Jollibee just for a second. Is it normal to need to go to the bathroom 10 minutes every time after you eat Jollibee? <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's a, it's a rite of passage. Okay, like, good you, to you know. Gotta, you gotta do that. I just wanna make sure it wasn't just me. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, what was your first SEO gig? Um, actually, it's kind of embarrassing, but um, um, I started working online, um, doing forum links for a bunch of adult websites. So I got it through Upwork and my job was to just build as many forum links as possible. I didn't know that was my first introduction to SEO, but that was it. So I kind of liked the idea of working online because it was kind of easy and I didn't have to commute back like from, from home to work, which is like pretty bad in the Philippines. So I started working online, started looking for more jobs. And that's when I started bumping into Kurt Philip from Convertica. And yeah, I started working with him for a couple of years then. Yeah, yeah. So the from my side of the story, I'm living in Chiang Mai. Me and Kurt decide to create a business together and we were actually going to go into lead generation. That's why it's called Lead Spring. And then we were just deciding, okay, how are we going to scale this thing? We'll need an operator. And then eventually he's like, oh, you got to meet this guy, Jay. So tell me what happened from your side of the story. Like, how did you get the proposal from Kurt? Oh, um, around that time, I wasn't actually working for Kurt anymore. But I remember I, I was enjoying working with him. So I would, even though I wasn't working for him, I would normally ping him at least once every couple of months to just check in. Like, hey, do you have any jobs for me that I can do? So eventually, I just kept doing that for, for about a year or so. And then eventually he got back to me and told me that he had a perfect position for me, which is, or which was um, the apprenticeship for LeadSpring. So yeah, that was, um, that was my uh, entrance to, to, to get into LeadSpring. And the part of the deal was for me to move to Thailand. So like being in the Philippines my entire life, never being, never having moved out from home. So that was kind of a big deal. So I talked to my parents about it. They didn't really think it was um, a legit job because like at the time online work was kind of still new so they advised me not to do it but knowing Kurt I knew I was getting something really good so I bit the bullet and used up most of my savings and flew out to Thailand. That that must have been a pretty difficult decision I mean your your parents were against the idea you had dipped into your savings to make the the, the move you had never left the country. Like, did you feel pretty confident or were you scared? Like, what was it like for you emotionally? Um, dude, I was really freaked out at first. Cause like, yeah, like I've never been, I've never taken that huge of a risk in my life. So taking that step was a huge thing for me. And looking back now, I kind of 
see that as like the game changer for me. Like that's when everything started to change in my life. So it was absolutely scary, but um, yeah. So I just went for it and I'm glad I did. That's awesome, man. Well, we're all the better for it. And I've seen you grown a, a lot since we first met. I, when was that? 2016, something like that. 2015. 2015. Okay. So I've seen you grown a ton. You basically started off as a VA type position. I guess we wouldn't call it a VA because you were in-person assistant, but you're working on like basic tasks. Then we trained you up to be a, a SEO project manager. Then you're managing a bunch of sites. Then you're managing people. Now you're the complete COO. What has that development felt like from your perspective? Um, to be honest, like when you're in the thick of it, you don't really notice those kind of changes. But from like right now, from time to time, I do kind of start started appreciating the growth that, that I've made over the years. And you kind of appreciate the journey so much more. And um, yeah, it's absolutely a roller coaster ride. So I'm really happy to be part of it. Are you surprised, like looking back, how far you come? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, yeah, definitely. Like when I first started, I didn't really set too high of an expectation in the beginning, but um, yeah, like I was kind of happy to kind of make a couple of grand a month and I was pretty content with that. But obviously like working with you, like mediocre isn't really something that we go for. So learning that from you um, to always strive for, for the absolute like highest possible goal that you can do. So I kept trying to like, work my way towards like being better and better every day. So, yeah. And maybe you kind of just answered this question, but I'm, I'm curious to, in your opinion, what part of your personality and your personal characteristics and traits do you think are helpful in this journey? Um, one of them is actually for sure stubbornness. Like my mom can attest to that. Yeah. So can I, um, <laughs> so I just wanted to keep going at it. Like, um, yeah, like when I started doing SEO, like, I knew it was gonna getting, it was gonna get big eventually. So I just kind of wanted to push it and push it and push it. But um, I know that personality kind of works uh, at my disadvantage sometimes. But for the most part, it's actually worked in my favor. So that's good. Um, another thing I can think of is just you know simply caring about what you do. So taking pride in what you do, taking pride in your work, and making sure that you're always putting in the best effort that you can do is definitely something that i've always like tried to do yeah and um yeah sorry. please continue no go for it um and i think the last one is um i think we're this is pretty common between the two of us for sure being a gamer played a huge role in in in, in being an seo like playing all those games like being like deciding real quick being a team player all that kind of stuff it's kind of the mentality of a gamer so it's so also like SEO, it's kind of like a game, right? Like you kind of level up when you increase rankings and all that stuff. So yeah, I kind of see SEO like a game. So it's like all those like stuff that you learn from, from video games, you kind of transfer over to SEO. Yeah, it's, it's super interesting. And for the people watching, the video game that we're actually talking about is World of Warcraft. Both me and Jay played it uh, an embarrassingly amount of time. <laughs> time and we used to actually have a criteria when we're hiring if someone said that they were a next gamer we'd actually ask this in the interview if they're a gamer we would try to figure out like how good of a gamer you are because like jade just said there's a lot of aspects of gaming that carry over to seo i mean it's management of resources you have to figure out where you want to put your time you got to stack multitasking on top of each other you're not just going to turn in one quest at a time you're going to turn in 15 at a time and, and save your time and that kind of stuff so, so I can definitely agree with that one. If I might also add, I think uh, another aspect to your personality is you're a perfectionist. And I guess you kind of touched upon this before in the, the way you said um, you, you take pride in the way you do anything. And the good thing about having perfectionists or different personality types in the top positions is it trickles down to the rest of the company just by, I don't know, absorption of culture or whatnot. So thankfully, we do have a great culture of like doing things properly and getting things right. Let's take a switch a little bit right now and talk about actual SEO and the projects that we're running. But in order to set the stage, what were the projects like when you first joined? Like what kind of websites were we mm. working on? What was the SEO like back then? Back then? Oh, it's so different, man. Um, like SEO before was a lot simpler. 
it, it, it was mostly just like PBN links and keyword stuffing on your content. Your content didn't even have to be good. Like it had to be decent and that would be good enough. So that was a huge part of it. And, um, and with links out, yeah, if you had like good PBNs, you'd, you'd probably make it work. And I remember at the time, and I would say like, the reason why I think it's so simple because at the time I was kind of managing about 30 something websites for the entire lead spring company. So that's, that's a lot. And right now as a company, and I, I, actually I was doing it single-handedly before and now we have a team of 50 something people and we're only managing um, a handful of sites, right? Like such a huge difference in, in processes and like the amount of work that goes into it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good segue into my next question. What are our projects like these days? Um, it's like night and day for sure. Um, we're not handling as many sites now, so we get, we get to focus a lot on quality and, um, we do still pump out a lot of content and which is our bread and butter right now. But the main focus really is the quality of the, the content. So yeah, the process is a lot different these days and, um, Traffic is a lot bigger these days as well. So we're pumping a lot of content. So those um, articles are getting us a lot of traffic. And also by doing that, we're also able to rank for a lot more keywords. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah, it's just, it's so different. I mean, back in the day, our websites were like 20 to 30 pages each. And we were getting content for like, I, I remember not wanting to pay over $5 an article from iWriter. <laughs> And like, we wouldn't even edit it. We just slap it right up there and put in a couple of images in a YouTube video. Like that was the process. <laughs> one, one image, one YouTube video and get it up there and done. And then these days it's like, yeah, I mean, some of our sites are approaching a thousand pages. We got like six and seven figures visitors per month. It's just completely different beast now, but we're, we're making more money. So I guess we're doing something right. Um, some more questions. I guess it's about time to get into what everyone's been waiting for is SEO nuggets. So Let's start talking about our SEO process, starting with keyword. Nah, let's take it back even further. Let's start talking about niche research. How does Leadspring determine what niches it wants to get into? Well, we normally scout marketplaces to kind of see what niches are actually making um, decent money. And the way we do it is we kind of base it on effort. So when I say that, we look at the number of pages on the site as well as the number of the RDs. So when I say RDs, I mean referring domains. So we kind of look at those numbers and kind of see how much does it take for a site or how much work does it take for, to get a site to this level? And we kind of use that information to figure out if we're going to start or buy a website within that niche. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the actual metrics we use is dollar per earnings per RD or earnings per index page, which is a pretty decent indicator of effort. Um, and just to clarify, we're, we're also looking at marketplaces to purchase websites, not just looking at niches, just to, just to be clear on that. And, and that is a big part of our model. We, we purchase all of our websites rather than start from scratch. Um, another thing I wanted to ask about is um, talk about the smart agency model that we've been dipping into for the past couple of years. So we kind of figured this out in the last year or two, I'd say. Um, well, we're SEOs, that's what we're really good at. So we want to be able to focus on that, doing SEO and not kind of like dipping into a lot of different things. So we started JVing with companies or people that are experts in their own respective fields. Um, if their businesses are making a certain amount of money and it's in a good level where we can actually take over, um, then that's really good for us. And yeah, we're definitely interested in like having a chat or partner up with business at that level where yeah, where we can actually take over the SEO. Yeah, just to comment a little bit on like why I personally like this model is because in the affiliate game, it's I mean the affiliate model is great. You flip your websites. There's nothing like it. It's just it's just absolutely amazing. But you have to worry about things like Google getting more um, picky about review co content quality and also EAT type stuff. When you're partnering with real businesses, and I'm talking about real established businesses real estate firms, law firms, and stuff like that, there is no EAT question. It's a real business. They're actually doing real business. So you can just, like Jay said, truly focus on what you're good at, and that's SEO. So I, I see this as maybe going 40-60, like 40% smart agency model and 60% SEO. 
affiliate in the future. And I like that balance. I like where we're going with things. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, cool. Um, keyword research. How do we do it? Oh, okay. This one's a big one. Um, so yeah, we do the recursive keyword research process, which we teach at the Fail Lab, which is pretty much um, grab your competitors um, that you want to go for and then list them down, go through all the keywords that they're looking at. I mean, all the keywords that they're actually ranking for, combine those into a list and then do another round of like checks on each keyword and then kind of categorize all those keywords. It's a little hard to explain because it's like a little bit complicated, but you teach it at the lab. So if you want to check it out, you can check it out there. Um, we also have this other technique, which is when you're at a certain level of say authority. So maybe you're a DR40 site and you want to try to look for, you know, like weaker competition keywords. What you can do is reverse engineer high authority sites in your niche, like the biggest as possible. So if, for example, if you're doing health niches or, or fitness niches, you can reverse engineer WebMD or Healthline and try to look at all the sites that are linking to them and reverse engineer those sites based on the, the lowest DR. So you want to look for relevant sites with the highest amount of traffic with the lowest DR and then try to look at the keywords that they're actually getting traffic from. And I think the most efficient way to do this is to use Facebook as the main site to reverse engineer because Facebook is the number one most linked site on the internet. So most of the sites are actually linking to Facebook. You'll get more data. It, it's going to take a lot longer to, to load on Ahrefs because there's so much data. There's like uh, a few million RDs. So it might take a while, but it's the most efficient way to look at like low competition keywords and sites. Nice. So just to echo this back with an example, let's say um, I'm trying to look for keywords in the keto diet niche. So I would plug Facebook into Ahrefs and look at who's linking to Facebook. And then I could set a filter on the domain names that are linking to Facebook and I just type in keto. So I'll get a list of 200,000 keto websites that are linking to Facebook, then sort them by traffic in DR and then look at the ones who has most traffic and the least DR. And they've obviously done keyword research correctly. Does it sound about right? Yeah. And you also want to look at all the sites that are just below your DR range because that's going to give you the most results. Awesome. Awesome. Great nugget there. Let's get into content. Um, roughly how many articles do we publish per day at LeadSpring? Um, across the entire portfolio, I'd say 10 a day. 10 a day? Maybe 15, something like that. 10 to 15 a day. So any tips to keep these numbers up while not sacrificing on quality? Um, yeah, the most important part of uh, the process is to make sure that your SOP is always bulletproof. Like always update your SOP and make it in a way that a 12 year old can actually understand your SOP and can actually perform the process. So you wanna put it that way and to kind of know if your SOP is actually good, you can get someone random to actually um, read the SOP and actually perform the task for you and have them give you feedback. So that way you can actually get the best um, version of your SOP. Um, what else? Uh, we also have checklists, which, is, um, which helps a lot when it comes to accountability, when it comes to our staff. And as managers, we also do random checks and audits to make sure that everyone knows that we're always looking to improve. And we're always watching the quality of the, the, the content that we're publishing. Yeah, I, I would say this last one is super important. If you just think about like what it must be like to be a writer, you show up the first day of work and you get this large SOP and you hit it out of the park, right? And then late, over time, you know, it's, it's a grind. You're showing up every day, you're producing 10,000 words a day, something like that. It's a grind. So you probably over time, maybe it's accidental or maybe on purpose, you start leaving out parts of the SOPs. I won't put in that expert quote or I won't optimize it to this degree. And you just see, did anyone catch me? And if they didn't, then you start yeah. slipping on some other stuff in the future. And that's why it's important to have these like spot checks to just go in and say, hey, people are watching and um, we need to keep the high quality up. So it's a good tip. Um, next question is, where do you find your writers? Um, it's actually getting a lot harder these days. We use a lot of different strategies. Um, number one, obviously, we still use Facebook groups like Cult of Copy, Freelance Writers, all those kind of groups. Um, we also use uh, ProBlogger. ProBlogger is pretty good. 
LinkedIn jobs, we also use that one, indeed.com. Um, we also get referrals from other writers. And one last one is, I'm, I'm forgetting right now, writer access also. I've heard a lot of good things about writer access, so we started trying out. And actually, it, it is pretty good. Nice. Um, how do you manage these writers? So if we're producing 10 a day, that means we have at least 10 writers, maybe more. And how do, what's the ideal like content team structure? Like what does the management tree look like? So we've tried a lot of different structures when it comes to um, the content team. So what we found that works best is to kind of use a pod structure. So we have the content manager at the very top. Um, their role is to enforce quality content into, in, in the entire department. It also includes um, choosing which topics to write about and also the site, I mean, what topics to write about for the site as well as hiring the writers. And after that, at the bottom uh, below the content manager is we have our content editors. So the content editor's role is to make sure that the content writing SOP is being followed by all the writers that report to them. We'll have a bunch of editors um, on our team that are assigned to different projects. They will also be directly reporting to the content manager. And then below the content editors, we have our writers. So every single content editor will probably have maybe two or three writers. So all of them will be directly reporting to the editor. And yeah, it's just going to go back and forth uh, from there. Nice, nice. What, how do you determine which con topics to write? Are we just, we're a fitness website, we'll write an article on protein powder and then steroids here. And then how to do squats over here. Is there any rhyme or reason to it? Right now, we kind of base this on which category makes us the most profit so we can focus on those first. Um, and then once we figure out which ones make us most money, we run topical mapping or we run the topical mapping process for each of those topics to, to collect every single relevant query for, for that main keyword. So we can kind of cover every single, yeah, every single keyword and topic. So once that's done, we write them based on which topic is easiest to rank for. And also, we're currently building out um, an automated process for the topical mapping process. And once that's built out, we're going to start sharing it on the affiliate lab. So we just need to work out the kinks. And if you want to check it out, you can check it out there. Cool. So for anyone who's uh, just heard this term topical map before, check out my interview with Corey on the topic of topical authority, which is um, a pretty interesting case study and pretty interesting like uh, approach to doing SEO. But like Jay said, we double down on one specific topic at a time. So if we determine protein powder is the one to go for, we're going to write every single article on protein powder before we move on to legal steroids or anything like that, starting with the easiest one to rank for first within the protein powder category. Done here, then we move over here, starting with the easiest one, and then blanket that. And we, we feel this is, determines uh, like maximum efficiency in terms of ROI. Um, okay, where does content optimization with Surfer fit into this process? Uh, we actually have had uh, great results from Surfer since we started using it. Um, it might be new articles or just simply page updates. But um, for new content, it's kind of built into the writing process itself. Our team writes their content on the Google Doc and using the Surfer plugin that allows it to kind of make it easier. Um, to insert all the keywords that they need to put in the content. Um, as far as um, the content updates, we normally go in and adjust the true density and word count every two or three months or whenever a page drops in ranking slightly. So we keep all the content um, as fresh as possible and as updated as possible. And we try to update as many pages as we need to to, to keep the freshness in tip-top shape. Yeah, an easy way to do this is uh, depending on your rank tracker, like most rank trackers can dump out a uh, like all the keywords in the, the current day's rankings. So we just do this every quarter and we look at the rankings for all the keywords today versus what they, were they three months ago. And if anyone went negative, those are candidates for content updates and uh, rewriting content. That's an easy way to do it. So once the uh, content is written by the writers, it's passed to the editor, the content manager approves it, how does it get on the site? What does that system look like? Okay, um, so we have this process called, or, or a system called the Outliner. It's a custom build, um, custom build page builder we use on WordPress where 
it makes it a lot easier. So normal page builders have a lot of bloat. It has a lot of codes that you don't need because it's meant for everyone, right? It, it's meant to like make everyone happy. But for our um, outliner, everything is preset. So there's no bloatage um, and everything is kind of easy to use. You just need to kind of drag and, drag and drop and everything's like perfectly formatted, perfectly sized and everything. You don't need to edit too much, which makes the whole uploading process so much faster for us. So whenever the content is done, that gets updated on our content overview sheet, which lets our content uploaders know that it's time to upload. And we usually do it in batches. So the process is a lot more efficient and faster. And their mindset is kind of like, it's easier to, to do. Cause like when you're working on a fitness site, you're gonna look for images that are in the fitness niche. So it's just easier to kind of streamline everything when you batch it. So once they do that, um, they just grab the content from the Google Docs and then they put it on the outliner and then save it as draft. And then when, once that is done, then the, the graphics designers come in, put in the images, which is also pretty easy. They, they edit the images, they resize it into the perfect sizes and then they just put it on the site. And then after that, the junior SEOs on our team, they come in, they review the content, they optimize the content, the three kings, put in the internal linking. So it's very important that they actually put in the internal linking right away. And as soon as they publish it, internal links should be present for the page already because that will help the initial ranking of the page. And also, yeah, um, yeah. once that's done, then they publish the page and then we try to force index those pages as soon as possible. Nice. I got a, two follow-up questions that I'm assuming a lot of the audience is, is going to be curious about. How did you get a custom uh, plugin or custom theme created? Um, I know the answer to that, but um, like, how did it get done and where did you find the person to do it? Um, our staff is uh, from India. He's a pretty good developer. Um, it, it's like, it's a little tricky to, to get it done, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of complicated, but the, the person needs to be, you know, very good in coding, obviously. Um, they need to be able to like, at least make a plugin on their own. And it took a lot of research um, to kind of pull this off. At first, he didn't know how to do it, but it just took a lot of research, a lot of um, testing on staging servers and all that stuff until eventually it started working. At first, it was a little clunky, but obviously with with usage and from, from our staff, we were able to like get some feedback and some stuff that didn't work as efficiently. And then we started editing it. And until now, which is like, it's, it's, a, it's at a good place right now where it's functioning properly. There's no more errors and it's pretty efficient. So we put our bets down on a, on a talented dev that didn't know how to do it, but he figured it out. Now that you know what kind of qualities um, it takes to build something like this, if you were to hire someone new, what would you, where would you go looking and what, what would you, what would you put in that job advertisement? Like what kind of skill sets mm. would you put in there? Mm. Um, for sure. They need to be excellent in CSS, PHP. Um, obviously website building is a huge factor. Um, one of the things that I always use when it comes to hiring a developer, which is very, very tricky because I'm not a coder myself. So I don't really know, um, like I don't really know as much as they do. So the main key thing that I always look for when it comes to hiring a dev is, are they able to create a simple plugin for me? So that's how I gauge it. So if they're able to create a simple plugin with my customization, then I, I would assume that they're good. And then I would test them a little bit uh, after that and then kind of gradually increase um, from there. As far as where to look for, we found them, we found them on a Facebook group but uh, we've also had good, um, good results from referrals. And also if you're looking for um, a really good dev, a, a good place to start with, uh, with that one is Stack Overflow, which is mm -hmm. a forum for developers. Cool. Would, would you say that every affiliate business needs a dev? At what point would you say it's worth it to get a dev? Um, when you're, when you're, um, trying to do more customizations on your site and trying to get it faster, trying to get it, um, yeah, trying to just improve past the normal um, stuff that your competitors are doing. That's when, if you want to get to that level, that's when you want to get a dev because a dev can obviously help you 
make all the these cost customizations, all these like better processes um, that can actually improve your business overall. Hmm. Nice. Okay. And um, another question related to uploading is custom images. Like I know we put a significant effort into making custom images for multiple reasons, but um, maybe you can talk more about like why we do custom images and and yeah, I mean we use it to get links too sometimes, right? Yeah, sure. So when it comes to custom images, what we do is we try to get unique images on um, on our pages as much as possible. So the the whole idea behind it is Google loves anything that's new, right? It likes fresh content and all that kind of stuff. Anything that's fresh and new, it loves. So that's what we're trying to do with the images. So what we do is we look for stock photos, but obviously stock photos will have a lot of usage. So what we do is we kind of resize the images, crop it a little bit, mirror it maybe a little bit, and then tilt it a little bit. And then with that, it's enough to make the image unique enough for, go for Google to not know that it's actually a stock photo. So yeah. that's how we make it unique. Yeah, and, and you can double check by putting your new image in Google reverse image search, and if nothing comes up, then it's brand new. Yeah. Cool. Um, we talked about interlinking. Um, let's talk about technical SEO. You're a technical SEO enthusiast. You're the one who handles technical SEO on all websites. Um, you especially have doubled down on Core Web Vitals and speed. Have, do you feel that we've had benefit from really cranking up our importance of, on speed and making our sites fast? Mm. So we did see a lot of gains um, by improving page speed, but that was because the site that we um, worked on was actually pretty slow. So I think with Core Web Vitals, a lot of people are, are obsessed with getting their scores to a perfect level, which I think is a little bit excessive because I think up to a certain point, um, as long as your site loads pretty fast, I think that's a good stopping point. You don't need to go all the way up to perfect levels because that's just way too much work. Like there's a lot of diminishing returns once you get to that good point. So I think when, once you're there and your site is loading a little bit faster than your competitors, I think you're, you're in a good place. Okay. I feel the same. Um, it, even if you check like page one, look and see how many people have perfect core web vitals. And it's like maybe one out of 10, if that usually zero out of 10. So, I mean, I think it's diminishing returns yeah. as well. What other technical SEO issues typically come up for with sites as huge as ours that you see? And like, what can people do to combat these technical issues? I think the number one issue that we've been facing a lot is um, negative SEO. So I think when you get to an authority site level, um, there's a lot more money involved. So there's a lot more at stake. So people are a lot more desperate to get back their rankings or to keep you away from their rankings and stuff like that. So we see a lot of spamming, a lot of brute force attacks and stuff like that. So yeah, when, when you outrank competition, that's eventually gonna happen. Um, so the number one priority for us is site security. Um, always have a CDN on your site. That's number one priority. Um, a CAPTCHA um, whenever, for, for um, admin logins, that's very, very important. Uh, monthly theme and plugin updates and WordPress updates. That's always a priority. A plugin that's outdated can be a vulnerability on your site. So that's a main um, focus. And also um, also have your hosting check for malware scans every few months or so. Because um, if you don't update your sites, um, those outdated plugins can definitely get some malware. So definitely get your hosting and do those checks. It's actually free. They, they'll, they'll be happy to do it for you. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Let's move on to everyone's favorite SEO topic, and that's link building. What would you say the difference is for link building to a new site versus an established site? Mm. So with new sites, we actually focus on trying to get as many links as possible from a ton of different sources. We, we run our normal um, guest posts and link insertion campaigns because that's the one that actually gets us the most links. Yeah. But we also do Hero as soon as possible to get those high authority links. And, and also other niche specific campaigns, we're also gonna run those because every single niche are different. So that's why I call them niche, niche specific. Um, but the goal is to get to a certain number of RD and DR for that site as far as 
um, older sites, once we've hit that level of DR and RD, what is that time in your head? Uh, I'd say about DR50 or around 800 referring domains, maybe a thousand. So that's a good um, for us, like a good indicator that we should slow down a little bit on the lower quali quality links. And when I say lower quality, I'm not saying like it's a bad link, but it's normally like DR20, DR30 and, and that kind of stuff. So once you get to that level, it's kind of time to pull back um, and focus more on the higher quality links and authority links. So we'll still do some guest posts and some link insertions, but um, it's only for niche relevant domains. So if you're in the fitness niche, you want links from fitness, fitness sites as well. So we're not going to skip those, even though they're lower in DR and, and lower stats. Um, we'll still do Harrow as always, um, but we'll, we'll add digi digital PR on top of that so we can get other links that Harrow isn't able to land us. And that's pretty much it. Yeah, you summed it up pretty good. Um, what other link types do we dip into? So you touched upon guest posting and link insertions. Those are our foundational links, niche specific links. And, and um, just to elaborate like on what Jay means by that, it's like we would, even though a site has moved into high authority status and we're, we start to focus on high authority links, if we're in the keto niche, we wouldn't say, oh, we would never turn down uh, any link from a website with keto in the domain name, for example. Like those, even if it was a DR10, like we're always going to accept those. Okay, so you talked about Haro and digital PR. What other types of links do we build? Uh, we have quite a few, actually. Um, we have skyscrapers, uh, skyscraper campaigns for sure. Uh, citations as well. Mm. We do a little bit of forum links as well, if they're niche relevant. So we're not going to build a ton of forum links, only if they're within the same niche. Um, blog comments as well, if they're in the same niche as well. But we're not going to build a ton of it because um, there's not too many high quality blog comment uh, opportunities anyway. Um, we also do affiliate outreach where we build partnerships with affiliate managers to get a link. Um, we also do a little PR, expert roundups, some link exchanges, three-way link exchanges where we, where we have sites that we buy links from and then we get a link from another site and then we give them a site from that site that we bought links from. So we don't actually give a link from our side. We just buy them a link from a different domain and get a link from them. And then we also have built-in link building, resource page link building, and obviously we sell you some GBNs on occasion. Yeah. Let's dig into, I think one of the most interesting ones and it's so easy to do is the affiliate outreach technique. Can you give that like an example with this? Let's say we're in the keto niche and we're promoting a product called uh, Keto Max. Like what would we do here? Sure. Um, so the, the whole idea behind this is to get links from these sites that you're actually promoting on your site. So if you're selling a bunch of different products in the keto niche, then it might be good to reach out to these um, keto products, right? So you wanna build a relationship with these affiliate managers and you're, you're normally able to also negotiate for higher commission rates, so that's double whammy. Um, and when you do this, you kind of get an opportunity to kind of pitch this affiliate outreach thing that we're talking about. So we pitch them by saying, hey, can you, um, you can see that we're actually promoting you as number one on our site. And you can see that it's a very positive review. Do you think you can help us rank better and push more leads your way? So it's, you're talking about the benefit that they can get out of this rather than like just focusing on what it's going to give you or it's going to get you. So more often than not, they're going to be interested in talking to you and they're going to be interested in giving you a link from a very relevant, relevant page on their site. And these highly relevant links are definitely something that you don't want to miss out on. And also, yeah. um, you can do this process for products that you're also not promoting as number one on your pages. You can actually talk to them and say, hey, do you want to be featured on our site as like um, a part of this page? And then normally, they'd be actually interested because, yeah, you'll, you'll be promoting their products. Why wouldn't they want that, right? So we'll, we'll do that as well. Yeah. The icing on the cake is if you have, you have a persona on the website. So um, if you want to know more about this, check out my video on the influencer pitch. But we usually have influencers that represent every single one of our websites. So when we get contact with one of these affiliate products and they give us a yes, we'll say something like, well, um, I don't know if you'd be interested in this, but our influencer, John Smith, really likes your product. He'd like to give you a quote if you'd be interested in putting that quote in your testimonial section on your homepage. 
now you got a homepage link going back to your website. And that's, that's the ultimate cream of the crop right there. Um, oh, and also like yep. if you're doing this, what you'll also get is an opportunity to actually get the products yourself. Like oh, yeah. they'll be happy to send you those products and you can use those products and actually create videos, create, take pictures and put it on your site. So it's a lot of benefits to it. Yeah, both me and Jay, our natural body weight is about 65 pounds. So we've been uh, hammering all these <laughs> supplements that we get sent our way. Um, next question is, what link building technique would you say is our uh, bread and butter? What just gets us the most links? For sure, guest posts and link insertions are the one that we get the most links yeah. from because they're the easiest to pull off. And they're very straightforward to run. And yeah, they, they convert very easily. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 what we start from day one and we only really start to taper it off. I mean, we never taper it, off, taper it off. When we hit our DR50 range, we just change the level of uh, link insertions yeah. and guest posts that we'll accept. But yeah, it's it's, it's a foundation, hands down. Uh, let's talk a little bit about monetization. How do we monetize and what's our breakdown of revenue looking like? So at the very top of the list for sure is or our affiliate commissions. Yeah. And these are non-affiliate, um, non-Amazon affiliate programs. So these are coming from reviews on our website and also some of our sites have YouTube videos where we sell those products and review those products. So we get commissions from those videos as well. Um, I would say the next one is um, affiliate, no, email marketing right now makes it quite a bit. And we also have display ads, which brings in a good chunk. And obviously we still get commissions from Amazon, but that's like maybe 3% or maybe even less than that. So we're not really focused on that. We're focused on the top three. Yeah, and let's not forget our revenue share from our smart agency JVs as well. That's uh, yeah. that's probably like 40% right there. Um, any other cash money tricks that we've done and, and are working out for us? Um, one cool thing we've actually done before was um, we rented out our Pixel. Um, that was obviously from you, uh, which is um, took a couple of emails from you, right? And Just so easy. We, we, yeah, it's very, very easy. And then definitely increased um, the revenue for that site. So we rented the, page, the, the, the Facebook pixel to that company that we were affiliated, affiliated with before and it brought in a decent chunk. And yeah, we teach, it, teach this one also on the affiliate lab if you want to learn more about it. Cool, cool. And I also talk about it in a semi-recent video on the channel. Um, I think it's like a monetization hacks or something like that, but I'll talk about the pixel renting there too, if you want to look at it for free. Um, next question. All of our websites are obviously built to sell. You know that, I know that. And I love the model because I, I see the, the numbers in it. I see that it's, I like to cash out. I like to de-risk by just um, trimming down the portfolio and getting a huge lump sum payment. But that's my perspective. What do you think of the model? Do you like it? Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay, I think good. the de-risking, <laughs> the de-risking part is the most important part of um, flipping sites. Because like the longer you hold it, and if you're at the very top um, or close to the very top, the only way uh, that you can go is pretty much just down. So it's better to de-risk yourself and just sell the site when you're at that level. So it, it also takes a little bit of um, experience to kind of know when you get there. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and another way I'd like to look at it, I mean, the, at the time of this recording, multiples are 55x. So if you sell a website that's making 10 grand a month, you sell it for $550,000, you have 55 months before that becomes a bad decision. And with, with a half a million, I'm pretty sure you can pull it off again. Um, so I, I just think it's, it's a no brainer. And even even so, like you can get into the flipping game where you take a, a, a chunk of that 550000 use it to buy a new site, and then just start to scale that way. It just starts to snowball. And the site that you bought at 55X, by the time you flip it, it's going to be 65X. So even, even just holding it, if it, it went nowhere, just the arbitrage itself, it's going to you know, earn you a good chunk of coin. So, I mean, the, I love the model. I, I wouldn't change anything at all. I think it's... Yeah. I agree. It's, um, this is how we've been from the beginning. And um, I, I see a lot more people seeing the light about this model and jumping on board. Uh, I'm glad too. I like the, the way the industry is going. Um, I, I source a lot of these questions from the community, just at putting out polls and asking 
you know, what kind of questions should we ask you? And a lot of them are about scaling. So the first question is, let's set the stage. How many employees does LeadSpring have, including writers, mm. roughly? I think right now we're close to around 50, maybe 55, because we just hired a bunch of people last week. So I think we're closer to 55 than 50. Um, I'd say half of them will be, or are writers. And the other half would be, um, I'm actually, no, no, half of them would be in-house staff. And then the other half would be a mix of writers, contractors, uh, link builders, and all those kind of stuff. Yeah, that sounds about right. And you're the glue of the company. You're the guy with the emotional intelligence, the quote unquote EQ. What do I mean by that? I guess um, that kind of means that I'm more emotional than you guys. <laughs> um, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> so I think, yeah, I think my empathy is quite high. So I think that's why that kind of just became my role in the company to be the, 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 peop the person that handles the morale of the team and the person that actually makes sure that everyone's mental health is good and just checking in with everyone and making sure that everyone's happy working for the company. Yeah. But let's talk about people management. What would you say it takes to make a company tick in terms of its people? Mm. So what I hear most from our team is that they appreciate it when we talk or, or when we take the time to get to know them. So we just asked them about their day, how their family's doing and stuff like that. So as a company, we always have these one-on-one -on -one meetings for every single direct report that we have. And um, with that one-on-one -on -one meeting, what we just talk about is, it's actually 30 minutes long, 15 minutes of it is just talking about personal stuff, just like getting to know each other, what happened with your last week, what did you do, and all that kind of stuff. And just like, just getting to know them. And by doing that, it, it kind of builds a relationship between me and the people that actually report to me. So that actually helps a lot. And when you have that kind of connection, I find that um, our team is able to kind of push through a little bit more and just kind of kind of like um, come through more for you more often than not. Yeah, I can agree. And this model that Jay's created between him and his direct reports, that scales out and the managers that he manages do that same with their, hit their direct reports. So it's kind of like a company culture type thing. What other tips do you have for scaling, hiring, staffing, all that kind of stuff? Um, I think the most important part is to always be on the lookout for, for new talent. Like you can't stop looking because the moment that you get um, complacent when it comes to your team, that's like you're putting yourself in a, in a dangerous position because if someone leaves, then you're, you're kind of, you're, you're, you're in, in trouble, right? So yeah, you can never have too many amazing employees. That's the whole goal. And what we also do is we kind of cycle out our team. So what we do is we pick two people from in, in the same position that are bottom performers. And what we do is we kind of hire two new people and then pit them up against each other. And then whoever performs or like, whoever performs the best out of those four, the two of them, they'll keep their jobs and the other two will obviously get canned. And also um, the, another tip that we have is, or another thing that we do is always have two people at the very minimum at every single position. That way you're never like, um, you're never stopping the process in case someone gets sick or in case someone goes missing and stuff like that. So always have a backup. That's very, very important. Um, that you heard it, everybody. From the king of empathy himself, you need to have a squid game contest and weed out the week every quarter. <laughs> I actually so. haven't watched squid game yet. <laughs> well, it's, it's written for you. Um, <laughs> okay, next question. Um, we, we use this, um, I don't know, it's not, it's not a saying or anything, but we always say to assign responsibility, not tasks. What does that mean? So, um, yeah, like, when it comes to those teams, like if you give out a task, the the employee that, that's taking on that task is just going to follow whatever you're doing. So if new things come up, that's not part of the stuff that you've included. They're kind of stuck, right? But if you give them a responsibility and an end goal, then they're able to like think for themselves and be, be able to like be more creative with like the solutions for that problem. And it also allows you to kind of, yeah, just like, um, kind of just give out responsibilities and not have to think about that ever again. Cause like 
they'll be responsible for it. You don't have to worry about it anymore because they'll take it on. And that's pretty much what we do. Yeah. An example of that might, might be a task version of something would be, here's a spreadsheet. It's got a list of domains. I want you to look at these metrics. And if two out of three of them are lower than these numbers, I want you to delete the row. That's a task. And it's pretty easy to follow. But a responsibility is, I want you to deliver every Monday a list of link prospects for our outreach team to reach out to. And I want them to be clean and high quality. So when you leave it open like this, it does leave some room for error, but it also leaves responsibility to the person to design a, a process that they take ownership of and they can improve on. And it's pretty much determines the quality of their work. So they're going to do it in such a way that's efficient and gets you a, a quality result. And they might even collaborate with other teams and ask them, hey, outreach team, what kind of links are you looking for? Like, is there any way I can get you anything better? That's what happens when you assign a responsibility as opposed to a task. Tasks, tasks is VA type mentality. Uh, responsibilities is, is employee type mentality. And I, I love this. I love that part of the way we do things. And um, since we're already talking about delegation, a couple more tips is always have like a clear end goal for, for your team. Always have a clear ETA for the, each project. Don't leave it hanging because like if you don't set an ETA, they're just going to keep dragging it on. So it's also going to mess up with you. So always have an ETA. And also whenever your employees ask you a question, force them to give you a solution along with their question rather than just a straight up question. This allows them to think for themselves and be more creative. And it's also going to help you in the long run because they're going to learn more and be able to like think for themselves a lot more. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think for a while we had a habit of whenever you're getting an email from someone, you just send it right back and say, what do you think? And then the emails yeah. stop coming after a while because <laughs> they start thinking. Yeah. Um, this is another question from the community. I'm not obviously not going to ask this question, but what it's like, what is it like working with me and what is it like working at LeadSpring? <laughs> it's actually, um, yeah, for sure. hundred percent. Like, um, it's been great learning, like learning from you directly. So, um, for sure, I, I tell this to everyone that just like living with you and working with you all the time definitely sped up my learning process. And I was able to like skip a lot of different steps and get me to where I wanted to be um, in, a, in a very short period of time. So that was definitely helpful. And it's definitely helped my growth as an entrepreneur, SEO, and just a, as a person in general. So it's not really every day that you get to work at a company where everyone thinks the way you do, everyone enjoys the same things that you do. And it's really been, been really fun to be part of something like this. Awesome. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I didn't pay him to say that, but it's good to hear it as well. Well, how would you describe our company culture? Like, what would you say the company culture is like at LeadSpring? Um, uh, one of our mottos is, our word is gold. So whenever you say something, you got to, own up to it. You got to make sure it happens all the time. And we try to always help each other out. We always watch each other's backs. And um, yeah, so I think, um, yeah, that's like one of the few things that we always talk about. And also like um, we always try to improve ourselves, always never stop developing ourselves, not only with work, but also personally. And we always try to optimize every single facet of our lives. And um, what else do you have? I think that's pretty much it. Uh, I want to talk about anything? optimization later. But like, I, I, I think, um, I'm not sure how the company culture at LeadSpring came about. I think it kind of just happened organically. But I'm glad we have it. And it's like the glue between us. But what do you think? Do you think it's important for like an affiliate marketing business to have a company culture? And if so, how does one go about making one? Mm. For sure, for sure. Um, uh, like, Obviously, the culture really helps when it comes to like employee retention. Um, having a fun environment to work at for sure makes it a lot easier to just go to work, right? Um, yeah. And um, what else? What was the other question? I forgot. How, how would you create a company culture? Like, I don't even uh, think we made ours intentionally. Oh, oh for sure. Um, I think it just starts from the top. Like, um, obviously, the top level management for sure needs to set the tone, right? And once you guys start doing that and you show that to every single one of your team members, then they obviously start picking those things up. And that's when 
that's how those things start, at least for us. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I read, I read a lot of business books lately about like the Netflix company culture, the Nike company culture and stuff like that. It, it, all of them say it starts at the top and just whatever the CEO is like, that's what his direct reports are going to be like, et cetera. Um, what would you say you struggled with the most as you took over more responsibility and were leveling up and how did you overcome these struggles? Um, actually, any new responsibility that's kind of introduced to you is always a struggle for me. Anything that's seen is always a struggle. Um, so yeah, trying to figure things out that you're not really too familiar with can be um, difficult at times. So yeah, but that's kind of part of growing and that's part of SEO. You just got to be, you know, just got to put on your, your big boy pants and just just do it. And yeah, I think one of the things also is just like accept that things are always changing and new things are always going to come up. And the, the moment that you accept those things, the, the easier it gets. So yeah, it's always constant. Like change is always constant. I got another question for you. Um, what did you have to change about yourself to get to this point? Like, what do you think was your biggest area of growth? So, yeah, um, I think one of the biggest parts for that is when I was younger, I was just, it, it was kind of like brute force. I would just plow away, go through my work day without any planning whatsoever. But these days, it's a lot more calculated. Um, I'm a lot more focused on optimizing my time at work so I don't have to spend 12 hours doing something when I can do it in eight hours. So it's all about optimizing. Um, it's all about structure and game planning ahead of time to actually get better and faster results within a smaller time period. Yeah. And you talked about optimization before and how at Lead Spring, we're not just optimizing at work, we're optimizing outside of life. What does your like daily routine look like? What does your routines in mm. life look like? Um, I think it's pretty similar to yours. Um, I wake up around 5.30, maybe 6 o'clock if I had a good sleep. Um, I do all my human stuff like brushing my teeth, drinking water, taking my supplements, taking a little salt and, and stuff like that. Um, and then I meditate for about 10, 15 minutes to start the day to get my mind right. And after that, I would just try to get, up, get some sun. Um, I would go out on my balcony, get some sun, get that morning sun in um, to kind of set my circadian rhythm. And I would also stretch at the same time to get like two things done at the same time. So stretching is a huge part for me because I'm not a young kid anymore. So you got to stretch all the time. Um, then after that, I'd get some food in and then do a little work. And then after that, I'd, I'd go to the gym and then obviously shower food. And then I'd do some work again. And then around mid afternoon where like the peak of the busyness of the day, I would take a little bit break to do a little meditation, maybe for like five to 10 minutes. Cause a lot of us kind of forget how busy we get. And yeah, some of us try to meditate at night, but at that time it might be a little too late. So I meditate midday just to like, uh, to kind of level um, everything. And then after that, I'll do a little bit more work and then, after a little bit more work, I'd probably just chill, maybe watch a little Netflix, watch a little YouTube, maybe a podcast or a book. And then by 9.30, I'm in bed and sleeping. That good stuff. Yeah, like a true robot. Everything nice <laughs> planned out. Good job. Uh, if you guys want to see my morning routine, I made a video on the channel. So um, it sounds pretty much exact to what Jay is doing as well. Um, what are your goals outside of SEO? What are your personal goals? Um, I'd love to hit around 10 to 20,000 monthly occurring from non SEO investments. So that's a huge part of me. Like um, passive income, real estate yeah, or, yeah. or dividends from stocks and stuff like stocks that. Stocks and stuff like that. Yeah. So I'm trying to invest a lot more, trying to focus a lot on, on trying to grow my investments so I can actually get recurring income outside of SEO. So it's actually a pretty lofty goal, but I just want to be secure for the future. And I also want to make sure that my health is a number one priority. So I do a lot of chiropractor sessions, a lot of massages, stretching. I, I try to eat as best as I could, try to watch my diet, um, workout, cardio, all that stuff. Top priority. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. And final question for you. If you had to start fresh in this SEO game, what would you do? If you or let's let's rephrase it. You got a cousin, he's like, I want to do what you did, Jay. 
you, you're, you're balling and you got this robot routine in the morning. I want to be like that. What do we, what do I do to get there? How do I start an SEO? What would you tell them to do? Well, if you're starting fresh, I'd say I'd start with client SEO, use that as a learning, uh, learning grounds for, to, to learn SEO and, and get the mistakes out of the way. But once you get a little um, savings and you're ready to start your own site and you feel like you're ready to take on an actual site, then I would go with either affiliate SEO or Legion SEO. Those two are, I'd say, pretty good. But I'd, I'd still choose affiliate SEO as number one because it's really competitive, but it also pays out really, really well. And, but yeah, if, if it were me, I'd go affiliate SEO. Nice, man. I, I couldn't agree more. Dude, thanks so much. I know we talk all the time, but it was good to actually dig in and figure out like your motivations behind things. And um, also, I, he has my complete approval, and I'm glad you shared a lot of the process that we use at LeadSpring. So thanks for being an open book, and I'll, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> awesome. I'm all glad right. to be here. Awesome. Take care, brother. Peace.